Okay, uh, welcome to our sixth uh, Good Meetup, hosted by Good Ada. And tonight we'll dive into the mo two most popular data cloud platforms on the market, which are Snowflake and Databricks. And now quickly for those who are new to Good Data, let me give just a quick introduction. So to keep it short, just think of Good Data as the bridge between your data and how you consume it. Our platform just enhances the data consumption with powerful semantic layer open APIs and SDKs. And as you can clearly see in the diagram, we support both Snowflake and Databricks. And that is why we have this meetup, of course. So today's agenda is pretty straightforward. We'll have two presentations each for roughly 15 minutes, and they will be presented by Jan Lasnička and Lukáš Langer. And then we'll have like short 15 minute break. And after that, we'll have panel discussion uh, hosted by Jacek, which is somewhere in the back there. Okay. So just some housekeeping. There will be two 15 minute presentations, panel discussion with Slido. You can scan the QR code here, or it's throughout the room. And after the whole thing ends, there will be more refreshment and networking. And if you have any questions, find anyone with Good Data t-shirt and they will be more than happy to help. And also, if you need to go to bathroom, just use the uh, back door and it will be the first um, door on your right. Okay. So now on to our first contender, Snowflake. And our presenter is going to be Jan Lasnička, who is the data engineering team lead at Billigence. And he is known for his expertise in developing and delivering innovative business intelligence and data analytics solutions. And his solutions are all over the globe, from Australia, USA, UK, Germany, and of course, in Czech Republic. Welcome, Jan. All right, so thank you very much for joining us today for the Good Meetup number six. And um, as Stepan mentioned, I'm the contender for Snowflake, and my name is Jan Lasnička. I work as a data engineering team lead at Billigence. Just a little bit about ourselves, because I know that I have also only 15 minutes to cover the whole Snowflake. So we're a data consultancy, originally founded in Sydney, Australia, but currently with offices around the world, also here in Karlin in Prague. And we um, are a data consultancy, and we work in four main pillars. So uh, everything from cloud analytics and data architecture, data engineering and automation, then also to the business side. So everything in the data visualization space, advanced analytics, ML, AI, and then I would say like an overarching fourth data governance, management, and strategy pillar. And today I'm, I'm here to talk about Snowflake which is a technology that basically fits into our four main pillars, into each and every one of them. Well, our goal at Billigence is that we're tool and cloud agnostic. We try to partner with what we think is the best of breed in each of the pillars, and Snowflake, we think, is definitely the best of breed in, in many of them. Um, just a, a, a quick overview of the topics that I'm gonna cover as part of my presentation. I'm gonna jump into these five areas in Snowflake, and I'm going to try to give you an overview what Snowflake is, what it does, and also what is its vision and when it's where it's heading. Because I'm using, yes, because I'm using some Snowflake slides, just a quick disclaimer that I need to put here before my actual presentation, but let's jump into it. So Snowflake, let's start with the overview. So Snowflake was founded more than 12 years ago now by three, uh, three guys. Two of them were ex-Oracle architects. And it was founded and built as a cloud-native data warehouse with completely separate compute and decoupled storage. And that's actually what it still is in its heart and core, right? The data warehousing functionalities of Snowflake are still the centerpiece of what is now known as a full-blown Snowflake data cloud platform, which is structured into four main layers, starting with the optimized storage, whether it's structured, semi-structured, unstructured data, you can put it into Snowflake, you can work with it. 
Then there is the decoupled multi-cluster elastic compute. That's the layer where you spin up the warehouses and you do everything on, on top of your data. Then the third layer are the cloud services, which power everything from uh, sharing, data marketplace, collaboration, all those security features, governance features, et cetera, et cetera, that's part, part of the cloud services. And the final one, so-called snow grid, that's the cloud agnostic component that gives you the possibility to share data and share everything with different snowflakes in different regions and in different clouds. So, and that's also one of the key features of Snowflake. It's a cloud agnostic platform. It's a software as a service platform and you can select which cloud and which region you deploy it on. Um, I mentioned it started as data warehouse. It started as a cloud native data warehouse, but throughout time it evolved into a multi-workload multi -workload data cloud tool, including AI, ML applications, meaning data applications, data engineering features, possibility to build, uh, integrate Snowflake with a data lake and build a proper data lake house, things like Unistore and also governance and marketplace features, everything packaged into this one uh, platform into this data cloud. And how is it priced? Well, Snowflake is priced um, actually quite simply. We have three main components when it comes to Snowflake pricing. First part, compute. That's the usage. That's the actual consumption that you spin up by using your so-called virtual warehouses. That's the concept of Snowflake. They're called virtual warehouses, and those are the compute units that you use in Snowflake. And normally, we see it's around 85% of the total spend when it comes to Snowflake. Optional serverless features, well, some of the features in Snowflake can be powered by the serverless components. If you spin them up, they are they charge you based on some serverless rates. Normally, it's just around 5%, but with the use of Gen AI and all of these AI functionalities, it, we might see this to grow a little bit more. Then there's storage. So you pay a monthly fee for the amount of data that you store compressed. And finally, data transfer. But that's only when you're doing data egress from your platform, from Snowflake, into a different region or into a different cloud. If it's the same cloud, same region, then it's uh, basically free of charge. And let me jump into Snowflake. I have the ambition that in all of these different sections that I have, I will try to jump into Snowflake and show you what it's about and show you a little bit live action in, in the tool. So this is how it looks. As I mentioned, Snow software as a service, fully accessible from your UI. This one is actually running in Azure in Australia. And um, the goal of Snowflake is to make everything as seamless as possible. So we have these different areas that we can work with it, with Snowflake and um, the, key, the, the key ones, the classic ones, the ones that it all started with are the databases, so the storage, accessible through the data pane. As you can see, the structure is similar to everything you know from, from different tools, even on-prem. So we have databases, we have schemas in those schemas. So for example, here we have the different objects, whether it's tables, views, stages, functions, whatever it may be. And in those tables, we can preview the data. We can have a look at everything. And obviously we can do this from the UI, but we can also do this from the SQL worksheets and also from the notebooks that we have available. The second component are the warehouses. The second key component, I would like to say. I mentioned completely decoupled storage and compute, and the compute nodes called virtual warehouses are accessible through this admin pane, this warehouse section. You can spin new ones very easily, and well, when they're suspended, you're not paying for anything, so you're they're not like dedicated for you. They're not running in the background or anything. You're just paying for the ones that you're using and for the time that you're using them. And the price depends on the size of the warehouse and if you put, make it multi-cluster or not. Right. I want to mention a couple of interesting features in Snowflake. I won't cover definitely all of them, but I just want to mention a couple of them. One of them is zero copy cloning. It's in the cloud. It's completely decoupled. And there is the metadata layer that I mentioned. And basically, there's metadata about everything in Snowflake. And Snowflake also uses the metadata to actually enable something called zero copy cloning. You can clone your data, but you're not copying them. You're only copying or you're only pointing the metadata to different objects. And only if you start writing to a newly, let's say, 
cloned database and you start diverging from the original state of it, you start paying for what you're safe in the new one. Time travel, interesting concept. Um, you can actually query in Snowflake anything at any point in time in some range, of course, that you define in your account. So you can actually uh, do things like undropping objects. So if you drop something and you decide, well, I should have dropped that or, or it was a mistake, I can undrop it. I can also query the state of the data as it was at some point in time in the past. And actually let's have a look at it. So if I go here, and this is my worksheet. This is where we work with the SQL, the Python, or whatever you choose your language is. And I have a simple like extended SQL here. So I'm creating a database and I'm copying and I'm cloning uh, originally uh, already existing database called Hackathon from our internal Hackathon. And I'm creating a clone of it, but I'm creating the clone as the data were at 1st of September uh, at noon. So let's let's run that. So basically now it's creating new object, but in the background, I'm not gonna be paying twice for the amount of data that I'm storing in the background. And it should be complete within a couple of seconds. So I'm expecting sometimes about now. And you can do it with everything. You can clone different objects. You can use this functionality to actually travel in time in Slowflake. And it actually simplifies a lot of things. For example, creating new, um, creating new development environments, creating on-demand uh, pre-prod environments, and you can integrate it with your CI CD pipelines, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Snowgrid, I mentioned that already. Snowflake is cloud agnostic. Of course, it grew on AWS, then it expanded to Azure, then it expanded to Google and what you can do is, as part of your organization, you can have different accounts in different or uh, in different clouds, a different region, and you can uh, replicate databases and different objects across those cloud across those clouds and do things like, of course, high availability, disaster recovery, and stuff like that. And it's actually very seamless. Second section: data engineering. Well, when it comes to data engineering, we have a lot of different components that we can use for the different aspects of the data pipeline, from the ingestion through the transformation to like everything around, like all the observability features and the actual experience. In the ingestion space, we can work with different approaches, whether it's like the classic way of batch copying data into Snowflake and storing it internally in Snowflake, or whether it's, for example, using Iceberg, so the open format. Um, we can do things like Snowpipe, which is like Snowflake's way of bringing the data from your storage accounts in, uh, in cloud, whether it's Azure Blob, AWS S3, and now even in the streaming kind of way when you connect it to your Kafka and you can stream to Snowflake data basically in real time. And we can then discuss what real time means for, for different people. Data transformations. Well, Snowflake was built for SQL. It was built by two ex Oracle architects plus one other guy. And uh, so that's where it shines. So if you wanna migrate your, uh, your data warehouse to the cloud, use SQL, then well, Snowflake would be a good choice. You can do different languages and that's where Snowpark component comes into play. Enables you to run Python, enables you to run Scala, Java on top of those virtual warehouses, on top of those compute units that you have. Well, and then we have different different um, orchestration features, streams, tasks, of course, the kind of familiar syntax from the data warehouses, so like store procedures. And we even have the new declarative way of doing data pipelines called dynamic tables. Well, and many observability and experience features, we can talk about it later, but I have only a limited amount of time, so I'm gonna rush through a little bit, right, okay. Um, I mentioned it, SQL, the native language of Snowflake, uh, standard SQL, ANSI support, full uh, asset compliance, everything's available in Snowflake. Of course, there's different syntax. So if you're coming from Microsoft SQL Server, you need to change something, some things won't be available, et cetera, et cetera. But generally, SQL is Snowflake's native language. I picked a couple of things that I just want to highlight as part of the data engineering pipeline. And the first one is Snowpipe. So we have two options when it comes to Snowpipe, which is like Snowflake's way of bringing data to Snowflake if you already have them in the cloud storage. So of course, doesn't take care of bringing it to the S3 buckets or to the Azure Blob. But when you have them there, you can use the Snowpipe to actually automatically ingest the data into Snowflake, either in the batch way, like normal files, or when you're streaming by rows. So for example, if you're using Apache Kafka, you can also use 
Snowpipe, but this time Snowpipe streaming to bring your data into Snowflake. Dynamic tables in the transformation space, interesting concept of declarative pipelines. So basically you are, and okay, it's just not visible, it's on the slide, but doesn't matter. Um, you basically define the end state of your transformation and you don't have to worry about anything else. You just say what the dependencies are, what the lag is, and you let it run and it runs and populates your pipeline throughout the uh, throughout your, basically the whole data pipeline. And let me show you how it actually looks. So again, just a quick sneak peek into Snowflake. We have this schema um, available just, so we're in the database section, we're looking at one schema and we have, um, as you can see, many different objects here. First of all, we have a pipe. So that's the snow pipe that I was talking about. It's bringing data to a table. The table's called Transactions Kafka Stream. So here we have some data being brought into Snowflake in basically real time. And then again, we can discuss what real time means for you. But then what we have is the dynamic tables. So on top of these tables, on top of this table, we have a dynamic table that actually kind of takes the data based on the lag that we define here, one minute lag. So we're basically near real time and we're taking the data from the stream and reaching it from different other tables and transforming it. And the way it's written is really like a declarative pipeline, basically fully in SQL, just with the right syntax and with the right uh, wording. Next section, artificial intelligence, machine learning. So Snowflake has been investing into different areas lately and mostly into the AI space because that's where companies invest these days. I want to split it into two, machine learning, AI. Machine learning, many different functionalities that basically cover the whole MLOps pipeline. Um, we have the development part of things, notebooks, we have the worksheets, so different approaches, how you can interact with, with, with Snowflake in this space. We have a native modeling capability, so you can actually push down the training of your model in the machine learning to Snowflake. You can do things like storing your features in the feature store, storing the trained models in your model registry, and then exposing it in a streamlit application. That's all powered either by a virtual warehouse that you create and that we saw previously or by con container services. A new concept in Snowflake, you can basically spin up like dockers in your Snowflake, communicate with your data and do more things in this space. For example, if you need GPU power training. This is just an example that basically all the different parts of the MLOps pipeline are covered. I'm, I know I'm simplifying it a little bit, but just basically all these different pieces are now available in Snowflake all the way to the inside because we can use also Snowflake for actually exposing the results of uh, the ML pipeline. Artificial in intelligence. In Snowflake, it's covered by a, uh, by, a, by a term called Cortex. So we have Snowflake Cortex and it powers different workloads. It powers simple use cases like document AI. We have universal search in Snowflake. We have Snowflake Copilot that can help you with your code all the way to more custom things. Like we can uh, build custom UIs in different app languages. We can fine tune the models and we can use the Snowpark container services for that as well. I'm going to just Quickly jump again into Snowflake. I just can't see it here. Yeah, so document AI, I mentioned it. One of the simple things that you can use in Snowflake without any coding experience, let's say. We have it here in the AI ML section. We upload the documents into Snowflake stage. We train on top of these models. And in each document, we basically help the model to be more precise and tell it what it got wrong and uh, what went well. And basically we can let even non-technical user into the tool to do it. And basically on top of that, we train the model. And once it's ready, we have a familiar extended SQL syntax that we can use as part of our pipeline to actually do document AI directly in our, in our pipeline and uh, embed it within our data flow. So data governance. Um, different features covered by the Snowflake Horizon uh, term whether it's from auto classification, tagging, dependencies, a lot of metadata available in Snowflake through different protection features, 
to all the collaboration features and we can and I think we will talk about it in the panel discussion afterwards. Um, I wanted to mention that we have something called cost management. So Snowflake is also investing in the areas of the observability when it comes to the data governance features as well as everything else. And we have like, this is one of the key things that we're using in Snowflake for data governance, right? We have the auto classification, tagging, and it can be all brought together with masking policies and we can do things like dynamic data masking. Well, and I'm gonna end up with um, vision of Snowflake. So where's actually Snowflake heading? Um, started with data warehouse, right? We got all the different features for engineering. We got all the different features for data governance. Now it's investing still in very much all the areas that it's actually committed to, whether it's Cortex with the Arctic LLM model, we have Cortex analyst, like an uh, interface that you can put on your top of your data, let the business people talk to your data together with the semantic model, Copilot, couple of things to mention, for example, support from for a Pandas API, and you can now write Pandas and put it like in a distributed way on your virtual warehouses. A uh, lot of investment into DevOps so that we can natively do everything together with, with Git providers and also data governance, where it's universal search, data quality monitoring, or for example, data lineage. And I'm done. Okay, so well, hopefully I gave you an overview of what Snowflake is about and I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. Thanks. Okay, and now let's hear from Lukash, who's the lead big data engineer and ML engineer at Data Centex. And he has three years of experience working with Databricks. So that's why we chose him. And this year he even got the Databricks Solution Architect Champion, which is the highest uh, certification awarded by Data Centex. All right, perfect. Can you guys hear me? Cool, cool, cool. All right. So uh, thanks uh, to Good Data Guys for inviting me to, to present this talk about Databricks. As was mentioned, my name is Lukáš, and uh, in, at, at Datacentix I do a little bit of everything. I'm a data engineer, ML engineer, software engineer on some days. Uh, sometimes I'm an architect, sometimes I do pre-sales, you, you know how it works. Um, and at Datacentix, uh, we, we're also a data uh, consultancy company, but uh, we mostly uh, we mostly specialize in building uh, data platforms and then delivering uh, machine learning use cases on top of them. So that's why I'm talking about Databricks because that's the perfect technology for us. So uh, I chose to uh, name my presentation Democratizing Data and AI. Uh, that's because uh, that's how the slide deck was called when I stole it from Databricks. And uh, in all seriousness, uh, what we're gonna talk about today is uh, uh, I want to do a brief theoretical introduction into the lake house. Uh, then I'm going to do like an extensive uh, UI demo of uh, how how it works when you're actually working in Databricks. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about architecture and pricing. Uh, then we're going to go over data engineering, warehousing, data science, ML, and of course, data governance with Unity Catalog. And uh, we're going to end on uh, the newest features and vision. So... Uh, What's the motivation here? Uh, we want to democratize data and AI. So uh, what's missing in most uh, enterprises? Uh, we, we, want, uh, we want data to be discoverable by all employees. Uh, we want them to access it if they have the permissions. Uh, we want them to be able to use the tools they're used to. So scientists want to use notebooks, uh, uh, SQL engineers want to use SQL uh, editors. Uh, we, we want them to uh, know what's in the data so they can use it, and we want to do it in secure and governed way, right? But what we see nowadays is that data and AI are siloed, right? Uh, each uh, department has their own data, they're playing with it, but uh, they're not really sharing it with the world. Uh, use cases take a long time to deliver. Uh, privacy and uh, data control are challenged by security, so nothing nothing gets done. And it's dependent on highly technical staff uh, who doesn't let anyone else to, uh, to, to do it. So what's the solution? Uh, solution is uh, something called the data lake house. 
uh, you know how to become the best at something, you know, invent a new category. So that's what Databricks did uh, when they combined the best of uh, Data Lake and uh, Data Warehouse. So you have the openness of, of Data Lake, just uh, raw data in, in cheap blob storage. And on top of that, you have powerful governance with uh, tools like the Delta Unity Catalog. And on top of that, you can deliver use cases across all uh, data practitioners uh, spaces. So you can do data science, you can do warehousing, and you can orchestrate it all in one platform. So that's the lake house. And uh, you know, if you believe Databricks, they will tell you that uh, most of the companies are using it nowadays. So. That was the theory. wasn't that hard. So uh, now let's uh, let's see what it actually looks like uh, in the real world. So I'm gonna show you the Databricks UI, and we're gonna go over how uh, I would deliver an end-to-end -end use case in in Databricks and uh, some of the cool functionalities uh, there. There. Can I put this away somehow? Okay, good. So. Uh, if we want to talk about Databricks, we need to talk about notebooks. Uh, how many of you have used Jupyter Notebook at some point in there? Okay, I see some hands. So you, you, oh, are you, you don't see this. Oh, sorry. Why am I stuck in this screen? Sorry about that. Now it works. That's weird. All right. So this is the this is the Databricks UI. Uh, we're inside a workspace. Uh, workspace is a unit of uh, Databricks where you can interact with uh, with the functionalities. You can have multiple work workspaces across all major uh, hyperscalers. Uh, this one is in Azure in in our organization. And uh, if if we're going to talk about Databricks, we need to start at a notebook. So so in the notebook, you you, you can interact with uh, with the code. And you can you can run code in uh, four major languages. You can run Python code, uh, mainly PySpark. You can run Scala. You can run R if you're a statistician. And of course, you can you can use you can use SQL on top of uh, data that's available uh, in the, in the data catalog. Uh, so 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 here you can see that uh, we have this three layer uh, three layer. A system where uh, you can uh, you can find your your data uh, using hierarchy of catalog schema schema and tables. There's also volumes, functions, and models. We're going to talk about that later. So here I develop some code. I can I can collaborate with others. I can uh, preview what the results are, and uh, when I'm happy with it, I can use the Git uh, Git integration to uh, uh, to commit it and push it into a Git repo. So you don't need to understand Git at all. You you can just use this this UI. <laughs> you you can create branches, pull from the repo, commit and push, and e even do some uh, functionalities like hard reset when something goes wrong. So so when I'm happy with it, I push it into a branch. I create a pull request, and uh, it can go into the main branch, and then then we can deploy it to production. So so how are we going to get it to production? Well, we're going to use uh, Databricks workflows. Uh, Databricks workflows is an orchestration tool integrated into Databricks, and I can just chain a bunch of notebooks uh, uh, behind one another to create a data pipeline. So so I can. Uh, uh, process uh, raw data into bronze, then enhance it a little bit into silver and then gold uh, for my uh, for my final uh, final results of, of a use case. And then here I can I can schedule it, for example, so so I can make it run once a day for a batch overnight job, or even uh, with uh, new functionalities, you can uh, you can use file arrival on blob storage or table update uh, in in your delta tables. So event driven architecture all the way. So that's basically how I would deliver a simple data uh, engineering task in Databricks uh, using the UI in my browser. But if I'm more into SQL, I can I can use a different UI. I can use a UI for for for, for SQL editor uh, where I have my SQL warehouse similar to to Snowflake, and uh, here I can just execute queries uh, and preview the results. I can schedule them as well. And uh, what 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 I can do uh, also is create simple dashboards. So 
straight inside of Databricks uh, workspace. There's a simple dashboarding tool. And if I don't need anything fancy uh, with Power BI, I can just do it here, uh, hook it up to serverless uh, cluster and uh, I'm good to go. And, uh, and uh, finally, I want to show you uh, this uh, very interesting new feature called Genie. So you all know ChatGPT, right? So uh, this is like a ChatGPT for your data. Uh, you can you can set up uh, data sets with uh, with tables inside of Unity Catalog, and uh, then you can ask questions in natural language about this data. So here I have this example of uh, orders and customers. It, it will even it will even describe the data for me. So if I've never seen it, I can I can work with it. That's the data literacy. And uh, th then I can just ask it uh, some some business questions. So so here I want three customers uh, with the highest number of orders, and it will just uh, create the SQL and and run it and show me the result. But I'm not happy with that. But it keeps context, so I can just add to the query, and uh, it will it will provide me with, for example, the names. So so that's a uh, pretty cool new functionality. Uh, so that's. Uh, mostly uh, the functionalities uh, regarding data engineering and warehousing inside of Databricks. And I also want to show you one more thing, and that is if uh, you don't fancy the Databricks UI, which is, of course, limited, uh, you can use your IDE. So, for example, I have my, my PyCharm here set up with uh, the connection to, to Databricks using Databricks Connect, and I can just uh, run SQL queries here run it and it will just show me the results in, in my command line like this. So if you're into software engineering and building a large uh, uh, object-oriented projects or whatever, uh, that's, uh, that's totally possible. Okay, let's go back to the presentation and uh, let's talk about architecture a little bit. So we have your data on your uh, left and you have the users uh, and uh, the app apps, they wanna consume the data on your right. And then in the middle, there's uh, there's some Databricks magic. And uh, Databricks, uh, uh, Databricks uh, splits into control plane and compute plane. Uh, it used to be just a simple compute plane, but now it's serverless and inside your network. Uh, control plane is like the brain of the operation. It takes uh, user inputs and uh, and the app's uh, API requests, and it triggers compute either serverless or uh, or in your network, uh, which takes the data from straight from your blob storage. So if you're a large enterprise worried about security, you can run everything inside your network. Nothing, no data leaves uh, leaves your secure space. But uh, nowadays, everything is moving to serverless. Of course, serverless is running in Databricks account, so you will have to uh, put your data outside your network. Let's talk pricing a little bit. Uh, as uh, is used to uh, uh, with uh, cloud services, it's a pay-as-you-go. The unit is called the DBU, Databricks unit. Uh, it's built per hour. Uh, and it scales with uh, the size of the workload. So a bigger cluster, you you pay more, but you pay different uh, amounts for different services used. So the pricing is a little bit of a mess. I guess we'll get into it uh, when uh, uh, there's a debate at the end. But uh, this is just for uh, using the Databricks uh, uh, intellectual property, of course, you have to pay for cloud resources like uh, uh, storage and uh, compute uh, separately, unless you're using serverless. Okay, uh, and now let's get more technical. So, uh, of course, uh, a data platform wouldn't be uh, possible without a uh, data transformation tool. Uh, in uh, Databricks, it's part the Spark engine. Uh, the original creators of Spark engine created Databricks to, to monetize the, the open source uh, project they created uh, by, by making it a managed service. Uh, Spark engine is awesome because it handles batch and real time in basically uh, the same uh, interface. It interfaces uh, with languages uh, like Scala, which it is uh, written in, Python, R, and of course, SQL. Uh, it can scale uh, immensely, and it has a great optimization engine. So uh, it's, uh, it's really capable and uh, good for big data. And of course, in Databricks, it's completely managed. You don't have to worry about setting it up yourself. 
Uh, the next big uh, pillar uh, of Databricks is the Delta Lake, another open source project. It's the file format uh, which is native to, to Databricks, but as I mentioned, it's op completely open and uh, it supports uh, ACID transactions, scalable metadata for optimization, uh, time travel. If you mess up, you can roll back, uh, unifies batch and streaming. It can handle petabytes of data as well as single row inserts. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, really powerful. Of course, uh, if uh, you were using a relational database, this is uh, like uh, uh, not normal stuff. But uh, mind you, this is uh, this is a uh, uh, lake, uh, you know, data, data lake, uh, uh, simple file format. So it's actually quite powerful. Uh, the new uh, kind of a cool feature is they want to unify all of these uh, data lake uh, formats like Apache Hoodie and Apache Iceberg in a project they call Uniform. Uh, so basically it's all built on Parquet files with uh, just metadata. So they just include all of the metadata and uh, you don't have to choose a special, a special format. You can just use Uniform for everything. Uh, we need to talk about Delta Life Tables. Uh, Delta Life Tables uh, is a solution from Databricks for uh, writing complete data pipelines. Uh, so uh, it's a declarative framework which handles batch and streaming uh, using the same code. You can write it in uh, PySpark or, or uh, SQL, and it handles uh, all of the things you want to do with your pipelines. So like full load, increment, uh, provides serverless infrastructure. Uh, you name it, uh, but it's a proprietary technology. So if you choose to use it, uh, you're kind of stuck with Databricks. Uh, and one cool feature is uh, data quality. It's built in straight into the code. So you just write your transformations and you can uh, set up expectations of the data. And if the data is invalid, you can choose what happens to it. You can set it aside and deal with it later. So that's pretty cool. Okay, Unity Catalog, big topic. Uh, Unity Catalog is the... Uh, governance tool of of Databricks, so it it handles uh, it handles connection to data from each workspace uh, from a centralized location or multiple locations, and it, it handles it using a role based access system. Uh, what's cool about uh, Unity Catalog is uh, you can bring your uh, existing legacy uh, databases or other uh, databases for use cases that Databricks is not uh, good for. You can even bring Snowflake if you wanted to. Uh, and you, you can plug it into the Unity Catalog uh, with uh, something called Lakehouse Federation, and it just becomes another catalog inside uh, of uh, Databricks. So you can just load it uh, straight into Databricks Compute uh, and uh, uh, you can do your transformations there. Um, there's also row and uh, column level security. So you can set up which columns will be uh, visible based on the, uh, the roles of the people accessing it. And you can, you can filter the data. And this makes uh, GDPR compliance uh, very, very simple. All right. Uh, one of the coolest features, at least uh, in my opinion, is uh, completely integrated lineage, right? So lineage is always hard when you need to do uh, impact analysis of a change. Uh, you you want to know which uh, which data comes from where, and it's it's hard uh, to to get this information. If you have all your data in Unity Catalog, you just get lineage for free. So if you just access uh, uh, tables from Spark and uh, transform them and uh, write them back into Unity Catalog, uh, Lineage just gets processed and uh, you get this nice graph, which you can then, uh, which you can then uh, export into another uh, data governance tool like Colibra, for example. Okay, now we need to talk about ML because uh, of course, uh, Databricks is an ML first uh, uh, platform. So uh, who, who of you think of themselves as data scientists? Okay, I see some hands. So I will need to explain the the model lifecycle. So basically to create a machine learning model, you need to prepare data, uh, do some experiments, maybe with different models, different different sets of parameters. Then you log those exper experiments and then you compare them uh, to see which one is the best. Uh, when, when you pick the best ones, uh, you, you need to register the model, and then you need to serve the model, either for batch or for real-time uh, inference. 
And all of this is handled by a, another open source tool developed by Databricks called MLflow. Uh, so all of these different flavors of models, you just log them into MLflow, go through this whole process, staging production, and then uh, you deploy it like a Docker container, which you can query with API. So that's pretty handy and is completely integrated into, into Databricks and into Unity Catalog uh, permission model. Uh, the new kind of uh, way to do AI in, in Databricks uh, is uh, uh, the set of uh, these Mosaic AI uh, features. Uh, Mosaic was a company they acquired like a year and a half ago. And basically, you can uh, deploy a complete uh, RAG application, uh, Retriever augmented generation application uh, inside of Databricks without uh, writing any code. Like you have your data in Unity Catalog, you, uh, you can even fi fine tune the, the, the model uh, and uh, then, then you can start writing your prompts and it's like a, uh, this model enhanced with your data and uh, you can just uh, run it straight from the UI. Very simple. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the newest features and the vision for the platform. So, of course, uh, at the, the Data and AI Summit in San Francisco, they announced like a million things. Uh, I'm not going to talk about everything, uh, but uh, I picked like the three that uh, I think are pretty cool. So, uh, they're moving into 100% serverless. Uh, it used to be just Databricks SQL, but now uh, basically anything uh, you can do in the platform can, can be done uh, using serverless compute. Another thing uh, more on the governance side is attribute-based uh, attribute access control, which means that instead of assigning people uh, permissions to uh, see data, you assign the data uh, some tags or with some metadata, you define uh, what needs to happen to it in which situation. So this should uh, make uh, uh, governing a uh, data platform much easier. And uh, the biggest one, at least for this audience, I think is this AI data warehouse optimization in the engine. So basically uh, what they want to do is analyze what queries you use on your data. And based on that, they train the model that should uh, predict uh, how the data should be laid out uh, in case, uh, uh, so, so it's uh, the most uh, uh, powerful, right? So uh, for example, uh, you can do this uh, liquid clustering optimization to uh, lay out your data so that uh, similar data is collocated so you don't have to open many files. And uh, if you set up this cluster by auto, uh, then uh, it will automatically decide which columns are uh, the most important ones for, uh, for liquid clustering. So I think that's pretty cool, but it's in preview, so we'll see uh, how it actually performs. And uh, that's all from me. Uh, so I want to summarize, right? Um, what's the vision for the platform? Um, Databricks aims to be this complete package of a platform where you can do engineering, data science, generative AI. You can orchestrate it uh, completely. You can let your uh, managers uh, talk to data without any coding experience. And uh, it just packages this completely uh, with the help of AI models, which optimize it under the hood and it makes everything seamless. So I think that's the uh, main vision of Databricks. Thank you. OK. So it seems we can start. Uh, so you can you can like start drinking more beers and eat more pizzas earlier. So this final uh, this final uh, phase of this meetup, uh, maybe you already realized that this will be some kind of panel discussion. But before we start, uh, I would like to thank 
uh, both of these presenters for like uh, investing a lot of effort uh, to prepare their presentations. I know exactly what is it about. I'm presenting quite often. Uh, their presentations were very challenging actually. Uh, they brought a lot of topics and then we said them that it, they will have only 15 minutes. Uh, they were really under huge stress. Uh, and then in the end, I notify them that it's okay. 20 minutes will be okay, maybe 25. But I challenged them a lot in the beginning and their presentations were actually great. Is it, is it right? Can, do you agree with me? <laughs> Perfect. Okay, uh, so uh, their presentations were, were actually uh, pitches for each of the technology. Yeah? The best you can get out of Snowflake and Databricks. My role today here is uh, to uh, break uh, their uh, sales engineering pitches and talk more about the reality. <laughs> yeah. But before we start, uh, I would like to make it a little bit interactive. I was actually quite surprised that so many uh, hands were raised when uh, one of you asked uh, who has already used a notebook and like 50% of people raised their hands. That's incredible, yeah. But my question would be like, please raise your hand uh, who is not allowed to use a cloud database or cloud data warehouse? Two hands, maybe three. That's incredible. Is anyone here from a Czech bank here? <laughs> and are you allowed to use cloud data warehouse? No, okay, okay. So everything is still the same after 10 years, perfect. <laughs> Okay, okay, so it's getting better. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's try both and then choose a third technology, why not? Uh, okay, okay. So, uh, okay. Uh, okay, uh, so we are in good data actually, right? Uh, so, first of all, I would like to punish I would like to punish Lukáš uh, because his presentation contained uh, analytics part uh, on the architecture picture and there was like Power BI, there was click, but there was no good data. Yeah. I, I was going to say that that's where you would put good data, but so when I didn't data have time, you know, just 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So I expect some kind of apologize after this panel discussion, sound like formal, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so uh, I would like to like uh, drill d down or dig deeper into the analytics because like you can build a lot of very nice and beautiful data pipelines, but in the end, like it should be about uh, to provide some value to business users. Yeah, so business users want to measure some metrics; uh, they want to be alerted in the right time and so on and they don't care if you use Snowflake or Databricks and if you write a nice SQL queries, yeah. So in the end, uh, I would like to talk about the analytics part at the very end of the data pipeline, but let's start from the beginning, uh, from the ingestion part, yeah. And so ingestion, yeah. Uh -huh. The reality in many companies is that there are like hundreds of databases for CRM, and for many other use cases. Uh, and not only databases, there are other types of data sources. And it, like you cannot do uh, unified analytics on top of these, these silos, so you need to move the data to a data warehouse like data, data bricks or Snowflake. Uh, so it may be very complex task. Uh, and my question is like, Currently, there is a trend, and actually it's supported by both Databricks and Snowflake, uh, to work with open data formats, yeah, like parquet files, iceberg tables, delta tables. So how often do you see in real like uh, use cases with real customers, how often do you see that they are capable of 
exporting these open formats from the like source databases, so, uh, the original sources, like transactional databases. Okay, so let me start maybe. Um, well, um, I think we see it very oftenly that they're actually already doing it. They're doing it even like in the on-premise setup that there is some kind of, some form of primitive, let's say data lake existing somewhere already with some CSV, some different files. And it's always also about the size of the company, but I think it's like still my preferred way of doing things that there is like a common la common lake that you can use and in big enterprises it's, and you mentioned it there's normally not only snowflake not only databricks there's normally snowflake and databricks and something else and it's good that if we bring the data into the lake we can then connect from the different different tools to the same data so yeah i think that we see it a lot and if um, they don't do it there's different paths to achieve that yeah, I agree here. Uh, I think it uh, comes down to if, if you're committed to the technology, right? If you're just trying Databricks, then you don't want to like uh, put all of your data into the cloud just so you could say if it works or not. So uh, for the for the POCs, maybe uh, you do like a one-time load or, or you use Lakehouse Federation, as I mentioned. But uh, if you're serious about building a modern data platform using Databricks, uh, which in our case, uh, that's most of our customers, then you need to build the Delta Lake House uh, from the ground up by creating a landing layer in whatever format and then putting it into Delta and Unity Catalog. And uh, so do you actually need to ingest data at all? I mean, like, you can connect uh, iceberg tables or delta tables directly to the database, and you don't need to do any kind of initial ingestions, and you, 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 you can directly start with the data transformations. Is that possible? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, what uh, Databricks is built on, right? You, you have this open uh, data lake in Delta, but it could be just Parquet or, or whatever, Delta Uniform. And then you have multiple tools accessing this data. One of them can be Databricks. And uh, you, you can have other tools for, for, for other use cases, right? But if uh, you actually want to build a modern data platform with uh, proper governance, then you should probably put it into Unity Catalog, and then you're kind of locking yourself in the Databricks ecosystem. I think the same stands for Snowflake. So there are different functionalities in Snowflake, external tables. And it's only um, if you want to bring it all the way through the open source formats, and if you want to just make it icebergs all the way, or if you just maybe use it for the first layers that you put external tables, maybe views on top of that, and then you materialize it in some sort of model internally in Snowflake. So also, yeah, from this perspective, definitely. Uh, definitely an option, and we see it a lot. OK, and now let's break it. Uh, so I assume that uh, uh, these engines uh, work like faster with na their native formats than with, with these open data for open table formats. Is it correct? And the question is, what is the difference? And if it's significant, then the question is, like from cost perspective, is it like better uh, to uh, be vendor locked and use native formats or to use open data formats? Okay, so I'll start. So, um, I mean, for Snowflake at least, it works always the best if you put the data into the internal st storage. So normally I like to do a combination. We start with the some kind of the external view on the lake. We just point to the data that are sitting on the lake. But then for the performance part and for the model part and the serving into tools like Good Data, we um, like to materialize it in Snowflake, but also the iceberg tables and everything in this space, the data lake house space is also evolving. So there will be a point in time, I believe, when this won't be longer an issue. Yeah, I think this is like the biggest strength of Databricks, right? Because Delta is the internal format. There is no internal format, right? So um, yeah, I, I think this is like the biggest difference between, between Snowflake and, and Databricks. And yeah, of course, there are layers on top of it, like Unity Catalog, which uh, is proprietary slash open source since uh, uh, since uh, San Francisco this year. But uh, um, yeah, at the, at the end of the day, you're still leaving your data in an open format uh, in, in the data lake. And you can connect different tools. If you choose to uh, ditch Databricks for something else, you're free to do it. Yeah, OK. And uh, just to make make it clear, 
So when I work with these open data formats, uh, so it can be as efficient as possible. In a way, I mean, for example, that filters can be pushed down, uh, you can partition it, uh, you can like uh, defragmentize it so there are not too many, uh, too small files. And so everything this is a part of the implementation of these open formats. So when you query these open tables, it's efficient. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. That, that's what I mentioned on, on the slide with the delta functionalities, right? Uh, it, it might sound uh, funny for someone coming from a relational database that, that like we're saying, oh, wait, this, we have uh, schema enforcement, right, in 2020 or something. But uh, yeah, that, that's the, uh, that, that's the issue with, 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 del uh, with data lakes. Like, uh, it's, it's harder to implement using these formats, but it's there and it, and it works uh, really well. And there's a new functionality coming on top of that, right? Uh, you, you mentioned like this data defragmentation, right? So you can like optimize the tables. Of course, uh, the performance degrades after uh, some time of using it. There's a lot of metadata, a lot of small files. You, you, you can optimize it, right? But uh, you have to think about it. You have to have the technical people uh, that know how, how to do it properly. You don't want to do it too often. You don't want to do it not, not enough. So uh, that's why this predictive optimization that was announced uh, this year comes in. And uh, basically, Databricks will do that for you for free in the background. Well, not for free, but. <laughs> and I would say, if you don't want to do these things, you go with Snowflake. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually attended a very nice presentation on Snowflake Summit. Uh, and they were talking about the native format and all the features you can get out of it. And the difference is obviously significant. On the other hand, there is a vendor lock. Uh, you know, so it's always, there are pros and cons, yeah. Okay, okay. So let's move to the data transformation. Uh, and let me change the questions I, <laughs> we agreed on, yeah? Because uh, during your presentations, new questions came to my mind. So my main question is actually, and it's not only related to data transformation, but in general, so you can build or buy. Yeah? It's always about build versus buy. And also there is a trend of consolidation <clears throat> because like in the past, uh, many new companies arise, uh, laser focused one of data governance, one on orchestration, one on whatever else. And uh, sooner or later, uh, real enterprises realized that like uh, integrating and maintaining so many components is very complicated. A lot of technical people are necessary and so on. And so the consolidation started and it's actually seen in the case of Databricks and Snowflake. Yeah? This data warehouse only is expanding rapidly and you can like orchestrate jobs there. You can uh, define transformations you can define data governance and so on. Yeah. So my question is, it's again proprietary, right? So my question is like, should I write DBT models? Um, should I use any other tools uh, like which are open source and supported by like large open source community? Or like, should I use these tools directly in Databricks and build it and buy it for quite a high price, but then I don't need technical people, maybe, or yes. So that's, that's the question, like in general. So maybe from my perspective, probably three aspects of this. So first is uh, the size of the company. Second would be the skill set. And I would say the third is the current stack. So uh, if you're looking at a smaller sized company and they want to do it end to end, but they don't necessarily need the kind of the enterprise level then maybe it's just one tool consolidation and that's everything. If you have the skill set and you have really the techie people that want to build it all, then well, why not to build it? Why, why block them in a kind of the streamlined but limited narrow lane? And, and the third thing is the current stack. So what I mean by that is if you have something for, for example, transformations or orchestrations already in your stack, that's doing something like dependencies and stuff, why would you switch to something that's I would say even less capable in the end, rather than maybe even uplift what you already have. You mentioned DBT, so maybe with something like DBT. Yeah, I have like a cautionary tale. So uh, we uh, had a client a couple of years ago 
who wanted to build like this perfect data platform, right? So uh, they uh, created their own uh, Spark uh, instances. They uh, added managed Jupyter notebooks. Uh, they they added open source ML flow, and uh, and they spent two years uh, developing this with a quite large team, and they haven't delivered any business value during this time, and. Uh, they were basically building Databricks, right? And their data science team, uh, you know, uh, was kind of bored because they couldn't do their job. So they just spun up uh, Databricks on the side and uh, instead of working in the target platform, they were delivering use cases there. So, I mean, in in my view, uh, if you want to keep, uh, if, 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 if you want to create a software startup inside your enterprise, you know, build a platform, uh, keep keep your technical people entertained, but if you want to deliver business value, just get Databricks. <laughs> that's that that that's uh, that's that's nice selling point. Thank you. Uh, but I am actually very surprised that you didn't mention the third option, and that's uh, to hire a consultancy company. <laughs> to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean th there is like this middle ground. Like, uh, of course, Databricks on paper looks like uh, it's a solution to all your problems, but it's it's not that. Like, you you will have to develop something on top of it, which is custom and like no platform can provide, right? But it's usually not the super low level stuff. It's it's not the compute engine. It's not the file uh, format or whatever. It's like your framework that uh, helps you deliver business value faster. And for that, like, go for it, right? Uh, if, if it makes sense, but uh, start building on something that already works for 80% of use cases. Perfect. Okay, so let's move to the analytics part. That's my area, actually. But you also mentioned that you provide such services to your customers. So my main question, and it's actually mentioned in the list we agreed on. My main question is, so, my personal experience with these kind of databases, like we, in good data, we have used Vertica database for many, many years. Yeah, it's very proprietary. It's also clustered columnar MPP. It's similar. Uh, our experience was like when you let like hundreds, thousands, or even more end users uh, to interact with dashboards or with any other analytical UI, basically. So in the end, like tens of thousands of queries are executed uh, simultaneously, actually, against the database. And like you can scale the database horizontally, that's OK. But the problem is the catalog, which is shared across the cluster. And so for example, when you create some cache tables very frequently, or you basically just need to do a lock because the consistency across the cluster, it's expensive. And the larger the cluster is, more expensive it is and the overhead is bigger and bigger. And in the end, you realize that like, yes, you can create, and let's move to the Snowflake and Databricks. You can create, for example, uh, hundreds of data warehouses in Snowflake, which are more or less isolated. But uh, eventually, you realize that you don't have money for your employees. Yeah. So my question is, so what would you recommend in this case that you need to let like many, many business end users to use an analytical solution and actually get the value out of the data eventually. Uh, so what would you recommend uh, when you need to run this on top of Snowflake or Databricks? Uh, so I think it's about proper governance. Um, so you, you have hundreds of users, you have thousands of users, you can, um, as, as you mentioned, if you let them all to query the data through some tool, and and basically it, it uh, spawns up million of millions of million, millions of queries in in Snowflake. That's going to cost you a hell of, a hell of money. But if you uh, design it right in a way that well, of course, if they're self-service and they don't need live data, you use extracts for that. If you have the production da dashboards and the production reporting uh, that needs the live data, you put live connections and you put auto-scaling warehouses be below that. And of course, there's some scaling in, uh, I mean, there's some um, caching in, in the tool like Snowflake as well that basically gives you answers to the repetitive queries. 
but it's a, it's it's always a combination. So you need to design it right in terms of the virtual warehouses. Of course, I wouldn't recommend doing thousands of different or hundreds of different warehouses. Rather, using the auto scaling capabilities together with the right distribution of life and extracts. Yeah, for, for me, just a disclaimer, uh, we don't usually do uh, like these big analytical use cases like you mentioned. Uh, our, our use cases are more uh, in the ML data product uh, kind of side. But uh, yeah, I think uh, it's, it's always a trade-off, right? Uh, either you can have uh, everything fast and then you're gonna pay a lot of money or y you uh, sacrifice something, sacrifice speed, uh, sacrifice uh, uh, complexity. And uh, of course, uh, the new uh, serverless warehouses, they, 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 they can take it. Uh, and with Spark especially, uh, you can uh, optimize for a certain type of use case. So if, if you know that your users uh, query this dashboard uh, uh, which calculates something very specific, you can like optimize the tables perfectly so it, uh, it will perform well. But of course, I, I can't imagine like, uh, you know, there being thousand dashboards and uh, hundreds of users. Yeah, so that, that's actually a reality of good data. Our main differentiator, or one of main differentiators, is actually something what we call multi-tenancy. So we sell good data to companies like Visa, and Visa is distributing the analytics to uh, uh, like tens of thousands of banks. And uh, behind that, there are like hundreds of thousands of users, actually. Uh, so uh, using the database directly uh, is, was always the problem for us. And so now is the time for my, my sales pitch. <laughs> uh, so the way how we approach it in good data is that we uh, like implement it and it's actually based also on open source, uh, but it's not based on like uh, lake house related technologies like Parquet, but it's based on project which is called Arrow. And the Arrow project is about uh, most efficient processing in memory and it's about most efficient exchange data across the network and based on this framework we built a caching intelligent caching in good data to like uh, uh, save all customers using snowflake and databricks so that's my sales pitch uh, but nothing is perfect obviously and we are evolving this stack a lot and we plan on a lot of new features in this area Okay, so that's uh, that's analytics. Maybe I would like, uh, how many time do we have before we allow everyone to ask questions? Is any organizer here? <laughs> no, okay. So let's, let's continue uh, like five minutes and then we let you ask any questions. So my f last question, or maybe let's start with the audience. So how important, or is anyone here for whom uh, the open source is important uh, in this case because from my point of view like Databricks is much more committed to open source than Snowflake yeah? at Snowflake Summit uh, Snowflake tried uh, to ride this wave as well they open source Pol Polaris catalog which is like the comp direct competitor to Unity catalog in Databricks uh, they started integrating with Iceberg tables so they are like trying to do it as well but Databricks has been doing it like last three, maybe four years, maybe even longer. So there is definitely a difference. But my question is, is it actually a big thing uh, for real data practitioners like you? So please raise your hand for whom like the commitment of Databricks to open source is important aspect. Okay, not so many. Okay, that, that's very good feedback, actually. Eh? And so what is your point of view? How important do you think, and not only now, but also in the future, how important this aspect is and will be? Yeah, and I mean, uh, personally, I, I also see another trend on the market. They are, like, invented more and more execution engines, which are open source. And they are trying to directly compete with platforms like Databricks and Snowflake. There is, for example, Apache Data Fusion. Yeah, there is DuckDB engine, and now there is also SaaS service Mother Duck, 
there is Polaris framework, there are many others. You can put them on top of these open formats like uh, Delta Table and Iceberg, and you can build open source stack out of it. Uh, also, in the past, we, we quite often we seen uh, that uh, some industry started with some like highly proprietary components, yeah, many competitors and so on, and then eventually it diverged uh, that these technologies became a commodity and they became an open source and nobody is like selling anything in this area anymore, yeah. So my question is, do you think that in the future data warehouse won't be a technology I need to buy, like for example web server now, yeah. What do you think? I think in the case of Databricks, uh, it's a good sales pitch, right? If uh, you're trying to convince someone to switch their whole uh, company to a new uh, uh, new data platform, you know, after switching already twice uh, during your career, uh, <laughs> then um, having this uh, uh, having this commitment that uh, you're not locking yourself completely is good at the decision moment of uh, of uh, of that journey right but uh, of course if you want to use the platform fully you will have to use the proprietary te technology which is uh, uh, which which is the best stuff right and uh, all all of the new uh, functionalities are coming out in uh, in uh, closed source right so um, yeah that that's like the pessimistic view there's also the optimistic view and that is like if but that, that I think only concerns like the biggest customers of Databricks. If you have some kind of issue, you could like uh, create a pull request into Spark, right? But I'm not sure if anyone's gonna do that. that, that that's actually the case. Like my personal experience is that I created pull requests into DuckDB and it was accepted and merged quite quickly. I communicated with them on Slack channel, like in, in their community. And it worked really well. I can imagine that it works very well also in Spark community, which is even much bigger, right? So that's the benefit coming from that it's open source. And you still can build a SaaS service on top of that, provide like maintenance, SLAs, and all this stuff. And you can make a business out of it, but the business is not related to the code, but it's related to services you like build on top of this code. Yeah, but then Microsoft comes and they <laughs> they package all your open source tools into their own closed source platform called Fabric. You know, that's that's very true, and it's again it's also the case of Redis actually in in AWS. But please, um, and I, and I think it's also about maturity, mainly for big enterprises, and we work with a lot of uh, big companies. It's about the maturity of the tool and what it can give you. I think like with both Databricks and Snowflake, they've been here for a while, each coming from a slightly different direction, the lake house, more the warehouse, kind of trying to go into the same area, basically. But it's also about the maturity, right? So the tools are mature in what they do, and they offer the, let's say, enterprise offering to the customers that actually need it and that need the trust into uh, the tool and that it's going to deliver all their uh, needs and also the security and all the setup around that. Um, so I think it might get there at some point. I don't think it's going to be in the near, near future. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is actually the case of Redis. Yeah, That's in memory cache, a key value store. And uh, there were many rumors and, and problems and failures around this technology. It's heavily uh, like utilized by AWS. Uh, they provide Elastic Cache on top of that. They changed the license to like push back the AWS. Then it it was changed back. Yeah, it was forked. Uh, but you cannot say that Redis is not mature enough. Actually, so the maturity is there. It's still managed by the community, but uh, the problem with business is definitely there. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, thank you for answering my questions. And now is the time for your questions. So like, yeah, so one microphone will be uh, taken uh, from one of you. And another option, okay, so there are some questions in Slido. So let me change my position. Oh no, okay, I can see it there, perfect. 
Okay, so the top question is how does the underlying Jenny model, is it Dolly, uh, on, the, the, on Databricks compare to industry best known GPT for blah, blah, blah models in regards to speed, precision, and costs? So that's maybe a question for you. Yeah, I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I'm pretty sure it's not Dolly because Dolly is like two years ago, so now, now they have DBRX. And uh, I would assume they're using their own model, but uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't remember the benchmarks. Uh, I think uh, GPT or 4.0 4 is, is better than DBRX, so they're probably using that. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's actually a pretty simple technology. They're just calling the API and they're just putting the data into it. So um, yeah, there's that. I, I, I have no idea. Like the. The uh, queries I tried, uh, the simple ones worked perfectly. Uh, if you try to combine two or three tables together, uh, it starts to get messy. It tries multiple times, and then it gives you like a SQL code that doesn't compute. So uh, it's a preview technology treated like that. Yeah, so we, uh, personally, good data doesn't believe in that. Uh, uh, we don't think that like text to SQL will work uh, in uh, even like far future, and that's why we like propagate to build a semantic layer on top of the physical data model, and define metrics in some higher language, and then with all the metadata, uh, you can train uh, LLM or you can build a rack on top of that, or you can fine tune LLM, and then when user asks very high level business questions, they can be answered there. Yeah. And not only by some execution, it can be also answered by already existing objects which are similar and so on. Yeah. So I don't think that, uh, but uh, as far as I know, Databricks, uh, they, uh, they acquired a company called Mosaic and this model is from Mosaic, right? Coming. Yeah, I think their uh, state of the art AI research is coming from Mosaic. Yeah. Okay, so the next question is, how is Databricks affected by uh, Microsoft Fabric? I think you skipped the question, but it's fine. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry. So, yeah, I think uh, um, it came like a stab in the back from Microsoft. Uh, it was quite unexpected when they announced it because Microsoft and Databricks were always partners and now uh, they're uh, creating a complete uh, co competition based on their open source technology. But uh, yeah, a Databricks uh, uh, official statement is that Fabric is not mature enough. And from uh, what I've heard uh, uh, from uh, my colleagues who, who are working with it, it, it is, uh, it, it's not uh, as, uh, as good as, as Databricks, right? It's like Databricks three years ago. So uh, they, they still have uh, some uh, gap to, to fill. Uh, yeah, but of course Databricks is not, not happy about it. Yeah, but actually they do quite a good marketing and that's the problem, yeah. And another problem is that you can, uh, like, uh, you can get it for free because you are a large Microsoft customer anyway because like Office 365 and so on. And the same is actually valid for Power BI. So it's not only like problems of Databricks, but it's also a problem of good data. And that's a typical, uh, typical way how Microsoft works, actually. I think uh, another argument of Databricks is that Databricks is uh, multi-cloud, right? You can have the same, basically the same experience on AWS, Azure, and GCP, which, uh, of course, with Fabric, you're stuck with Microsoft forever. So, but I don't know who, who, who changes hyperscalers uh, every year. Yeah. So the next question, uh, the first one, yeah? Okay, so uh, to do not mess it up again. So I have heard that Databricks, there are so many questions about Databricks. Uh, uh, so may, <laughs> that's you, not, maybe you can answer. It's not, it's, not, it's not fair, it's not fair. I think just Snowflake is so clear and seamless, there don't, they don't need ah, questions. Everything works, there, there are no open <laughs> questions uh, anymore, okay. But maybe the, actually is Snowflake anyhow affected by Microsoft Fabric? That's a good question. I think of course. So so both for Databricks as well as Snowflake, it's a big competition. I mean, Snowflake is still a partner of Azure, and it's uh, well there is a link with with Fabric, and they're trying to position it as that they're complementing in some way. 
but it, it's affected. But as I as, as Lukas also mentioned, it's quite a new um, combination of old tools from from uh, the Azure space, and it will take time to get the maturity, and we'll see what the cost going to look like in a couple of months and years. So also the cost perspective is going to be interesting. And so, uh, follow-up question: When Snowflake will support Delta Table format? Soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you mean I mean like you can then migrate from Fabric easily uh, now to Databricks, obviously, but later on to Snowflake as well. The yeah, same, absolutely. The same the, files. The will question be. is different. When's gonna Fabric support Iceberg? <laughs> Never. <laughs> Obviously, but uh, actually, uh, these two formats won't survive forever. Yeah, like the announcement coming from Databricks at Databricks Summit was, we want to sh to merge these two formats. Uh, we uh, like now people from both communities are working in in Databricks and they are trying to introduce a unified format on top of that. So hopefully, like in in midterm future, we will see only one format and it will be de facto standard, just like currently Parquet file format is. Okay, uh, next Databricks question. <laughs> I have heard that Databricks is actually quite expensive. Uh, what do the benchmarks say? Uh, I mean, I would say that cloud is expensive and uh, <laughs> everything in it, uh, but uh, I think the problem is somewhere else, right? Uh, the, the problem is with pricing. It's, it's very not transparent. It's virtually impossible to know how much uh, your uh, workload is gonna cost uh, before you actually turn it on. So, and then people are surprised because they uh, they they thought it's gonna be like X hundred dollars and it's like thousand dollars, right? So, uh, yeah, I mean, it is expensive, but uh, the point is that if your uh, workloads are creating business value, then doesn't matter how much it costs if it creates more than it uh, costs. And have you ever seen any like serious benchmark or serious comparison between Databricks and Snowflake for the same load? Like for example, TPCH benchmark? I've only seen slides from Databricks. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to react on that? Yeah, I also have some slides from Snowflake. <laughs> Okay, so maybe it's an uh, opportunity for me to finally like compare them. See, like the only problem is th so, uh, and that's actually a question for you. So, uh, can I be absolutely sure when I set up a Databricks cluster? Uh, can I be absolutely sure what like compute resources, I mean, number of CPUs and so on, are under the hood so I can compare it with the same sizing of Snowflake, for example? Uh, yeah, if, if you use the old school clusters uh, in your own network, then you have full control over it. Of course, if you turn on auto scaling, then uh, you're putting yourself in Databricks hands. But uh, yeah, uh, for that, uh, you, you, you do have full knowledge. But of course, once you turn on serverless, uh, it's uh, anyone's guess. Okay. Okay, next question. Uh, I have heard that Snowflake is performing better than Databricks. Do you have any data or comparisons? All these questions are actually coming from Anonymous. That's <laughs> well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that there is a clear, like, strict um, result that Snowflake would be performing better than Databricks. I think it always depends on what kind of workload you're you're using. Snowflake was built on SQL, right? It's SQL first. Databricks was built on Spark. You can tune Spark. You can also tune SQL. It depends how you have your setup in terms of how are the queries written, how is your pipeline written, is your code totally rubbish, and you just are increasing the size of your warehouse. Well, probably not a good idea, and better idea would be to remodel it, build it better. And I guess you can make Snowflake perform, and you can make Databricks perform, and it's also on the skill set in the company if you have a skilled team that works with Spark, have worked with Spark for a lot of years, well, why not? You, you'll be able to tune it in Databricks. Same in Snowflake, and there are also features for, for tuning. So I wouldn't say, and I don't have any clear comparison, only the slides that are always claiming that Snowflake is performing better or Databricks is performing better. You can make both perform if you have the right setup. Maybe uh, since PySpark and Snowpark have the same interface, we should uh, write code uh, in both and uh, see which one performs better. 
Uh, the, uh, always the question is if it's important. Yeah. Uh, from like 10 years of experience in good data, I can say that when you like fix the solution, no, no, no. First, you fix business requirements and you get like three orders of magnitude uh, difference because you do completely different transformations, different queries, you need to crunch much less data. That's the best way, you, best thing you can do, yeah. And then, like you can you can optimize the physical data model, SQL queries, and again you can get two orders of magnitude. And then you can use Snowflake or or Databricks, and you can get like how much? Maybe tens of percents of difference. So what is the what should be the priority here, right? Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, should we continue till eight, or should we stop? Are you already tired? Nope. No. <laughs> so five more minutes, yeah? Because I am going to, I am quite becoming tired. <laughs> uh, okay, that's actually an interesting question. Uh, is anyone here from Kebula? Yes. I, okay, perfect. So do you know why Kebula chose Snowflake? Uh, uh, please wait, wait for the microphone. Uh, we have spare microphone for you. So I'm Eliška from Kebula. I'm not a technical position, but uh, I'm not there that long. Uh, Kebula chose Snowflake before I joined uh, three years ago. But I remember that Kebula was originally on Redshift, but it was not performing, so they were trying to find something else as a backend. And Snowflake was rising. We are like one of the first customers of Snowflake, and simply it was the best choice at that time. Yeah, I think it's like quite long ago. So Databricks wasn't that major at that time, I think. So maybe that's why. And, and maybe I would add to it that a lot of actually these kind of companies and also like DBT Cloud or Matillion were built on Snowflake first, then expanded to other solutions. I think it's also because as you're saying, it was about the maturity and the use case. So SQL first compared to machine learning, data science, engineering first, right? So maybe that was also the um, reason why. Okay. This question is so complicated. Uh, so, sir, okay, you ch <laughs> so, someone changed it. Perfect. Uh, so how advanced and how useful is Databricks Assistant that can take a nature language question and suggest SQL queries? Okay, so I think we already answered this question, maybe uh, partially only. It, this something else, uh, this, this is not Genie, this is like the uh, yeah. code autocomplete, right? It's like the co-pilot. Yeah. And I think it's actually pretty good. Like they, they turned on this annoying feature that when your code fails, it uh, uh, pushes it into the assistant and it tries to tell you like what to fix and it's always some bullshit. Uh, but uh, if you're writing SQL uh, and you, for example, have already some uh, lines written, uh, it can suggest like pretty cool things. Like uh, if, if you have two tables uh, which you need to join on different named columns, it will like write the join for you. Just write join and it will just suggest the rest. So I, I think it's actually pretty good if you if you give it a chance. But uh, for more complex stuff, like uh, for the um, prompting that you just tell it what you want your code to do, it's it's not going to work. But it can give you a baseline that you can work on. And can you fine tune it, actually? I don't think so. Not yet. <laughs> I mean, it should. Uh, it's it's running on a platform called Lakehouse IQ, uh, and they want to like feed all of the metadata from the whole platform into it. So it should like learn based on what you do in the platform. Uh, but yeah, we'll see. That's the far future. Okay. One last minute for one last question. So so it's again. <laughs> Uh, do you see any risks with Databricks changing the pricing or moving to more closed source with a potential IPO on the horizon? 
I mean, the IPO has been on the horizon for three years now. So it's like in good data, we always say like IPO in two years. <laughs> and we, we, we have been saying it like for the last eight years, maybe. No, no, but I have noticed uh, some mm, change push towards uh, like very aggressive sales and even the like Databricks uh, solution architects who should advise clients uh, how, how to run their platform the best. Uh, they they suggest like preview features that you know they're they're good enough even though uh, pricing doesn't exist or something like that. So I think that's really worrying. I I don't uh, believe that was the case two years ago. So yeah, uh, I I see some risk for customers who don't know that this is the motivation behind uh, what they're doing. And are salespeople in Snowflake the same? Um, I wouldn't say so. There were some problems in the past with actually not really, I would say, Snowflake sales, but the partner side pushing Snowflake on functionalities that were even like in private preview. So I think that's been very much discouraged and also like punished. I don't know if punished, but discouraged definitely. So what still can happen, of course, depends on the person. Okay. So that was the last question. Uh, okay, so uh, I have one last uh, uh, request for you. Uh, please raise your hand uh, who, after all of this, would vote for Databricks. Oh, and for Snowflake? Uh, let's see if people are not sleeping. Okay, so I, I'm afraid that there are slightly more people for Snowflake, uh, but it will change next year. Okay, so that's uh, that's all. So thank you that you came. Uh, uh, actually, we maybe uh, haven't seen so many people here. It's sixth meetup here, and uh, it's really great to see so many. And actually, the very, uh, very relevant audience, yeah. So thank you that you came and let's start networking. Please do not uh, do not come. It's a lot of food here, a lot of drinking here. Everything is here. Nothing is at home. So please stay <laughs> and continue with networking. And uh, you can ask any questions uh, to our great speakers, uh, as well as to me, as well as to any anybody from Good Data here. So do not leave, please. Thank you.